Okay, that's his channel. Everything recording? So, uh, welcome to week three. Uh, so, I hope we can start week three uh, with um, some of the main things that um, uh, we're interested in in this course, which is this notion of emulation. It's also sometimes known as surrogate modeling. You'll see that term used a lot. The reason I use emulation as a term is because a lot of these techniques were developed in the University of Sheffield, where I used to be based by um, Tony O'Hagan and others, and they called it emulation. So uh, we tend to use that term, but it's, it's widely talked about as uh, surrogate modeling as well. You can use the terms interchangeably. So um, the basic idea, and we're going to still talk a few, about a few more different simulations before we get on to seeing a couple of examples of this idea in practice, is that these emergent phenomena that we're seeing in the game of life or in uh, Navier-Stokes equations generating hurricanes, they require computational power to unpick. And one of the things we said we could do is we could actually borrow from the real world and use data about what happens in the data. But the other thing we can do is we can borrow from what simulations have done before in the past. So in surrogate modeling, what you're trying to do is you combine information from your simulation with information from the real world using statistical or machine learning models. And whether you think of them as statistical or machine learning models probably depends far more on your background, whether you were trained as a statistician or a computer scientist than anything else. But basically the techniques are the same. So different types of simulation that we've started to look at, these could be differential equation models. So the, these could be abstracted differential equation models. So what I mean by that is that the differential equation is, uh, I mean, we talked a little bit about effective physics, the models, the sort of models of physics we see in the real world, but even a physic, effective physics we think of as very true. But some of these epidemiological models, you know, the, the way that viruses um, transmit from one person to another, we represent it as a differential equation but that's sort of quite a strong approximation in terms of what's actually uh, going on because the differential equation has assumptions in it that are related to um, how contacts are occurring that are very good assumptions if you're mixing chemicals in beakers and not very good assumptions if you're mixing discrete individuals in lecture theaters <laughs> or however else with transmitting pandemic. Um, and they can be quite fine grained though, like in climate or weather. Now the other, other, other simulations we haven't talked about so much and we'll give a couple of examples of, could be like discrete event simulations. So the game of life is a discrete event type setup and it's not in, in the simulation itself. It's just sort of like you run it in terms, time is a discrete thing, you update things at every turn. Um, but other examples of that, so if you're doing Formula One strategy, simulations, you tend to do discrete event simulations where each lap is a discrete event and you, you calculate what happened in the lap and you have some assumptions about overtaking. So that would be a discrete event simulation. Another type of discrete event simulation is um, the Gillespie algorithm. And that's an algorithm where um, uh, instead of doing turns every second and see what's being updated, you, um, you work out what the next event will be. So the Gillespie algorithm is about uh, discrete chemical combinations uh, is, is quite commonly used for. So you sort of, you work out, um, you sample from an exponential distribution to work out the timing of the next chemical collision. And then you jump forward in time to that. And then you look at the consequence of that. And then you simulate when's the next thing happening. So that's a different type of discrete event uh, simulation that exploits understanding of um, how we think chemicals are mixed. It's known as the Gillespie algorithm. Um, we've talked a bit about how simulations work at different fidelities and, and when we think about the formula one situation i sort of mentioned as well that like as well as a race simulation you know you you actually simulate the quality of the car its aerodynamic capabilities you can think about this as simulations at totally different fidelities when you're doing the race simulation you don't actually run the computational fluid dynamics on every car on the track to work out who's overtaking who you just step back and say well on average we can see that when there's a lap time differential fundamental lap time differential between two cars of this size, we get a probability overtake that in a curve that fits this form. And that's the level that those simulations operate at, either based on lap time or top speed on the straight. Um, 
So it's totally different fidelity. You don't sort of, you don't like take into account personal relationships between drivers when you're simulating, you know, that they dislike each other. But, but in practice, those things exist. There are things like, there was an example in, um, when I was working for one team where they made a strategy decision that was based on what the computer simulation said, whereas everyone in the team knew that the driver that they would have got stuck behind had they pitted was a development driver of that team, so would never hold them up, right? <laughs> Whereas the simulation doesn't know that, so the simulation says don't pit, but everyone in the team knew that that wasn't going to be a problem. So that's a question of the granularity that the simulation is running at. But then if you make a choice to integrate that type of information, you have to integrate all the other things like, oh, but that driver dislikes that driver and all these sort of things. And then this is the sort of challenge of the granularity of the simulation. So there's some examples of these things in the, um, uh, the um, in the notebook, and one of them is uh, an SEIR model, which is a differential compartmental differential equation model that is the sort of thing that you use in epidemiology. And, and I took this from uh, work from Thomas House. I think Thomas was on FPIM, the uh, the body that was recommending uh, how government acts. Um, that was formed of computational epidemiologists. And this type of um, this type of model is, and you know, it's explained more detail in the notes. But um, it's got, uh, in this case, four compartments, which will be things like infected, um, exposed, and etc. And, and the reason you have two compartments for one of these states is to try and get the statistics of the infection time right. Because if you're using a classical differential equation model, there's a sort of timing of infection that that implies, which would be somehow associated with uh, sort of some form of exponential uh, decay of the length of time of infection. And if you actually know that people aren't infected, you like you aren't infected with COVID for an exponentially distributed amount of time. So what you do is then you sort of say, well, we'll have two states of infection that you have to go from one infection time and leave that infection time and then go to a secondary state of infection, because that means you're now summing two exponential distributions to give your total time. And what is the sum of two exponential distributions distributed as? That'd be cool if someone knew. A gamma distribution. So that actually allows you to go from an exponential assumption for what the infected time, length of time is, to a gamma distribution with a shape parameter of two in the gamma distribution, which allows you to sort of represent more closely the amount of time people are actually infected for. If you do three compartments, you get a gamma distribution with a shape parameter of three. And then you're getting a more and more peak distribution and you sort of can control things in that way. It's a highly artificial way of controlling things because what you're effectively saying is in order to represent these infection times, I'm going to assume what actually happens is that there's a sum that, that you're infected in one state and then infected in the second state and infected in the third state. And it's all to do with trying to get these models to match the duration statistics that we observe in the real world because these models are so abstracted that they're not really representing how diseases transmit. So in this model, which is a very, and, and Thomas, I've told Thomas I'm using this in lectures, and he says, oh, be very clear that, you know, this was the first thing I did to illustrate. It's not, it's just an out of the box model that Thomas shared before the first lockdown in the UK in a blog post to help people understand some of the issues around um, COVID. So, but I've taken the code from that and, and, and run some simulations from it. So you can sort of, there's a number of, differential equations that are all about who's in which state and the proportions are in which state if you've got R is recovered. Um, so people who are all dead, it's recovered or dead. You can't be reinfected if you're dead. In, the mo in this model, the assumption is that once you've caught the disease once, you don't catch it again. Of course, at this time, by the way, we didn't know whether that was true or not. We had no idea. I mean, and of course, as time has gone, on that our understanding of that has changed. And of course the disease has mutated. So its ability to reinfect has been varying the whole time. Interestingly, by the way, it was all this sort of sense that we were ignorant of that. We weren't ignorant of that. There were many, many people who were expert in coronaviruses, which are widespread, who said that what was gonna basically happen is pretty much what has happened. 
the fact that the press didn't bother to interview them because they knew about endemic coronaviruses that cause common cold. And they said, well, they typically tend to have these immunity periods of a year to 18 months. And so we can expect in the future some pattern like that. So none of it was really surprising if you asked the right experts, but perhaps surprising if you asked the wrong expert that was still prepared to offer an opinion. Um, so these are the sort of simulations that you get from uh, this model in terms of these uh, different states. And in this case, uh, I think what was going on is um, he's exploring different scenarios for introducing uh, lockdown, which is a change of parameter in this setup. And you can see the code he set up for doing that. This is at a time when the UK hadn't locked down. It was also at a time when our experts had misestimated the doubling time of the virus. And there's a famous moment when uh, our experts said we were four weeks behind Italy, when anyone who looked at the data could see we were only two weeks behind Italy. And the reason for that mistake is an error that had occurred in one of these experts' papers that had misestimated the doubling time. But interestingly, if you just looked at the data, you didn't need this paper. You could see we were two weeks behind just by looking at curves. Um, so the danger of over relying on models, right? Um, so this was sort of that period where we weren't locked down and, and what um, Thomas is trying to do is, is show the effect of locking down early leads to a smaller peak, right? And, and then he, he will, you know, what's the, um, what's the sort of, oh, this is in, these are millions of infected cases, right? And so these are sort of um, nationwide statistics. So. I don't know if you remember this period, but there was this period at the beginning of the pandemic when this question was coming a lot. And so Thomas is doing his effort for public understanding of science there. Um, and you can sort of see some of the sort of results you get from those simulations. So I, um, I can't remember what's going on, why there's a double peak here, maybe there's a double lockdown, but you'll see it in the simulations and you can sort of play around with it. So that, that's what the simulation is saying. The interesting question you might be interested in is perhaps, what is the largest number of infections? Let's say we're doing NHS planning, you know, and we want to know what's the peak we're going to have to deal with, how many hospital beds do we have to have available? The answer you might be interested in from these simulations is what is the maximum number of infected patients? And the point is you could imagine, instead of running the simulation, this is a fast simulation, but that the actual simulations that um, people were using to do epidemiological prediction had a lot more things involved in this. Maybe if that simulation was particularly slow, in order to explore that simulation space, you might build machine learning models to predict that peak, to help you explore aspects of that. That's certainly, by the way, what happens in these Formula One simulation models, um, that a number of teams use surrogate modeling and emulation to, to make those predictions and better explore the right relevant part of the space. So that's in the notes for you to play with. Now, when you're doing that, um, you've got various strategies for um, simulation. So you've got various things going on. You typically, I think, these are the three categories I think that you see. You've got the state variables, which are the state of what's going on in the simulation, some of which you may or may not be interested in, but they're important in the simulation to lead to the conclusions. You've got parameters of the simulation, which are somehow sort of inputs. So this is the time at which I'm going to lock down. This is the reproduction rate I expect in the virus or you know, in the car examples, this is the top speed of the car. This is the average lap time of the car, whatever we think of those things. The state variables would be like the positions of the cars and the race. And then you've got results and your results is the sort of defined thing. This is the thing I care about. Now, what the result is that you care about is going to be highly contextual, right? So one of the things I think someone maybe asked me, it was um, after the lecture last week is, well, you can't just replace the simulation with the emulation, with the surrogate model. Absolutely not. Yeah, you, you need access to the simulation because you can only understand what your surrogate model should be given the context of the question you're asking. And that's sort of how you define your result. The result could be, you know, what any one of these state variables at any given time. So in the sort of infectious disease case, we're saying, well, the result is the state of the number of infected people at its maximum, right? So that's the result of the simulation, but it could be a number of other different states, like uh, what's the, at which point is the last person not infected? And so in the, um, in Thomas House example, you've got susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered. So, that's the sort of four compartment, S-E-I-R, 
and we had two compartments for infectious to help with those statistics. So the S is susceptible, that people who are in the population who can pick up the virus he is exposed, um, but it could be, there's this notion that you could have been exposed and about to become infectious, but you're not yet infectious yet. Actually, what, you know, what we found out and people didn't know at this time, but there was some suspicion is that people were highly infectious for a long period of asymptomatic, which was one of the problems we had with the virus. I don't think that's included in this model. It was before we understood those details and then recovered, but recovered includes died. So there's a sort of parameters in for that. Those are the state variables. The parameters, the reproduction number, the expected length of infection and the lockdown timings and the results could be e.g. the total amount of deaths or the total amount of infected people, which is defined according to the context. So which of those things you're looking to model is going to vary according to what your question is and what your context is, even if the simulation itself is, is the same, right? So Strategies for simulation is usually emulated to map from the parameters to the total number of deaths. So, and then we treat the parameters and the results of the simulator as inputs and outputs for the emulator, right? So we create a mathematical function. Let's assume it's going to be a Gaussian process. We could use any mathematical function. There's various reasons that Gaussian processes are quite good for this, but in, in the past we've used neural networks for this, linear models, all sorts of things, right? That's the basic idea. Now, Beyond that, and the reason, one of the reasons I got sort of very into this is, is another type of simulation that isn't these differential equations or discrete event simulations, backtesting production code. So one of the things that's going on at Amazon when we're running the supply chain is you've got this vast supply chain code base that is making all these predictions and doing all these things um, and saying we should buy this amount of stuff. And then you would have a result a week later and you'd find that your supply chain was short on some stock item, right? So you, you like, you wanted, you wanted to sell these uh, the Yeti blue microphones, right? And, and you sort of had a sense of the demand and you have a sense of the supply. You've made a certain number of orders. You, you expect to be able to hit your demand. There's something called, a, the out, called the out of stock OOS statistic for would exist for these things in Amazon. That's a statistic. I'm sure these are sold on Amazon. I'm sure there's an out of stock metric for them. And that is like, how often are people clicking on that page, going to that item and finding the item to be out of stock? So that's measured for every single item across uh, the entire supply chain. At the vice president level, when someone's sitting there and looking at those statistics, they're not looking at specifically the Yeti blue statistic. So they, they categorize things, they abstract things, they sort of gather this together with other pieces of hardware that are being sold. And then you start looking at out of stock metrics uh, for categories such as computer peripherals, right? And then what will happen is there will be an out of stock prediction or for the given week, it will say in Germany, we were out of stock for computer peripherals X percentage of the time, which is outside the characteristics that the vice president is expecting to hear. He knows we're expected to be under that. So he says, why is that? And then you have to do a sort of entire analysis, which could involve back testing your code. So going back to your code and sort of trying to understand why didn't it order enough? Uh, what's gone on? Did it misunderstand the rate at which these computer peripherals were going to be supplied? Did it misunderstand what the demand was? Did a large ship get stuck across the Suez Canal and block, you know, or whatever? Those are the, you know, these genuinely like it, um, affect everything that's going on. Use my favorite one was sitting in a meeting, one of these meetings once, and someone sort of goes, oh, that's the fidget spinner problem. What do you mean that's the fidget spinner problem? And, and, and it was before I joined the team, fidget spinners had been a thing. And the effect of demand on fidget spinners in the Amazon supply chain, the demand was so high for fidget spinners that it knocked out some of the classical statistics that people are used to monitoring. So a lot of the statistics are computed on the basis of the previous year, how things perform because of the seasonal variations. But the, the, the transient fidget fin, fidget fin <laughs> transient fidget spinner effect was damaging the statistics next year in terms of what we were expecting to sort of see. So there was this sort of like thing that looked like there was a flaw in the supply chain when what was really going on is the statistics around fidget spinners were so far out of whack 
in terms of the orders, that they were undermining the statistics that were being used for the next year. So that was called the fidget spinner problem. Um, so that's the sort of thing that's sort of coming up, you know, in the sort of level that these things propagate and someone's making a decision. But the, the sort of then the follow up, what they were constantly doing is for that week is what corrective actions do they need to take to ensure that this wasn't going to propagate to the next week. So there's all these sort of questions around why. But to answer the question around why you're having to rerun your, your production code. Now think of that production code as a simulation, right? So that code has been run multiple times. We sort of know how it performs across a billion products. Why run the code? Why not just go to an emulator or surrogate model? Then you could ask more questions of your system and give the uh, vice president answers that are more fine grained for whatever the question they're asking. So that wouldn't just apply to um, the supply chain, that applied across Amazon. So there's a number of little examples. I've, I've provided YouTube videos if you want to hear more. This is, um, I think, Tom Taylor on the left. By the time I left, he was in overall charge of the lecture. This is Joe Walowski, who um, was one of the vice presidents, and Rohit Prasad. And Rohit, um, was a, so he was the guy who got Alexa's um, use deep learning to get Alexa up to the speech processing capability that was sufficient for it to be shipped. Like at the time, now that speech processing capability, you don't think much of it, lots of devices have it, but it was a massive breakthrough um, to get that level of capability. It was all based on deep neural networks and Rohit um, led that team and, and became a very senior person in the organization. But the whole sort of process of running something like an intelligent agent such as Alexa, you have all these sort of compartment things going on. So on the, on the and you know, what I've tried to do, because I'm sort of quite aware of, I was involved with some, I mean, I knew Rohit quite well. I met Tom a few times I, I, and I would hear the sort of conversations they're having, but I'm trying to use public materials to make sure I'm not revealing anything. So these are public materials, this architecture overview that is showing you what happens when you ask um, Alexa a question. Uh, it goes into this device, and as it goes up here, uh, see it identifies skill name, analyzes and understands the request. One of the things that goes on is every time you make a request of Alexa, every single capability prepares to answer because of there's a latency issue. So it doesn't then work out what's the request and then fire up the relevant capability to give you the sort of latency you need. If you say, Alexa, what's the time? Like it's checking whether it, that, that query goes to the thing that would tell you what Obama's shoe size is. It also goes to the thing that would play Stormzy for you um, and every other single service. It's pretty, imagine like that. So all of those things operate and then some other subsystem says, this is the answer that was required. Because if you don't do that, you get, well, certainly this way it used to be, you may have changed that. Um, you get um, latency problems. And a lot of that is happening in the cloud with AWS Lambda. And I don't know about you, but I mean, my personal opinion is Alexa's kind of degraded as a product since when it first came out. And I don't know if it's perception or if it's, but I think one of the problems they face is the number of those different services and trying to just understand the quality of service it's giving. And, you know, these are very, very complex and large systems and the politics and the arguments, because of course, like each team wins credit if their service is being used more. So imagine being the person who decides which of the services returned. I mean, it's a real nightmare because it's very difficult to understand who's adding value to the uh, ecosystem. And at some point, I can't say the number of staff, but there were more staff working on this than there were on optimizing the supply chain. So imagine all the politics of that. So you should want to be able to back test the code and understand what's going on. And by the way, I should say, neither of these systems had the capability I'm talking about, right? Neither of these things could do this. They couldn't do this in Alexa, they couldn't do this in the supply chain. So these are things that we need systems to do. And the current system state of the art, Amazon's ahead of most people on this. They're not like behind anyone that these systems can't do. Um, so it's actually, it's one of the major things that the, my research group works on. And I think so much of it, it's not the, um, so much of it is to do with uh, your effort to deploy quickly. It's very hard to deploy and maintain production code. And the practices you use around that um, are targeted towards, if, if you haven't considered these sort of, Okay, how do we do it? We do it by separation of concerns. It's something I'll come on to later, actually. 
everything is done by separation of concerns. You give small teams ownership of a component and they deploy that component in an ecosystem and those ecosystems link up, right? Amazon's architected entirely in that way. Now, if you separate concerns in that way, that means no one's concerned about the overall system, right? Because that's the bottleneck. The reason you're doing separation of concerns is because you can't have a gatekeeper that says, if you have a gatekeeper that says what you can and can't deploy, everything slows up, right? And so in software engineering, we've learned you shouldn't have that. You should decompose your problem into subsets of problems, which is exactly the Alexa architecture. Um, but then the problem becomes is if there are things that are pervasive across the system, unless you've thought about that carefully before you deploy, about how you're going to deal with those things downstream, no one's, that gatekeeping role that is problematic is now kind of useful, or I, I like to call it a curation role. So the, the way you have to address that is you have to have thought about those problems occurring when you set up the social dynamics of your teams and the tools that they're using and everything else so that you're not interfering with the way that the teams are deploying, but the result of what you're doing is baked into the solution. Right now, we call that data oriented architecture. So, in my group, this is something that we sort of say we should be doing that the way you do that is to use data oriented architectures. Well, what is a data oriented architecture? We don't really know, but it's something that does that. The notion is that if you had a data oriented architecture, and that's the sort of thing we research, that you would be able to automatically do this form of surrogate modeling in a programmatic way. And there's a number of ways in which you could see that should be possible. The fact that it isn't possible is, is often to do with what the existing tools are, what current software practices are. Sorry, long. you got me on like one of my major research projects. So I, I tried to include, I mean, for just sort of getting a sense, again, I mean, I was so great that, because there's these things that you just don't know if you're allowed to talk about, but when you see someone else is talking about these things, uh, who's this, who at the time, Jeff Wilkie, when he was, he was the CEO of Worldwide Consumer, so he was like my boss's 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 boss. So he's reporting to Jeff Bezos. I thought he was an amazing person. I mean, not like morally or spiritually, just in terms of his capability, maybe he was. But as a leader, I really, you know, there's lots of things you can argue I don't like about Amazon, you like about Amazon, whatever else. But, but some of their capabilities for their leadership and his technical skill set, and I think it was very, very sad for Amazon that he left. I suspect he left because the other guy, Andy Jassy, took over. From, so he would have been the other candidate to take over from Bezos. He would have been the one I would have thought was the better candidate. And you can see him talking about, he doesn't work for Amazon anymore. You can see him talking about um, Alexa there, or you'll see Pro, Rohit perhaps talking about it. And you can just hear about some of the challenges that you're getting in these sort of systems that these people are putting together. Um, I want to mention Catherine Breslin because uh, she, um, she was working uh, in the Cambridge lab on this and uh, Catherine's a PhD graduate from engineering here and she now runs her own, um, uh, she's great. And I learned a lot from Catherine and she runs her own um, uh, consultancy now in intelligent agents and speech processing in Cambridge called Kingfisher Labs. So, uh, but she, she was a real expert in, in locally in the team. The other people were not based in Cambridge, but Catherine was. And this is the, the knowledge base team is the so-called EV team. So that was, a, that was a startup in Cambridge that got bought and absorbed. And these are some of the people again, who actually graduated from Cambridge and David Hardcastle, who actually was the, the site lead for the Amazon site here and is now at Prime Video that were all in Cambridge running the knowledge base portion that was basically scraping information from Wikipedia and providing that and answers to questions. One thing that happened while I was there is they bought another, another knowledge base company in Santa Barbara. So they had two knowledge base systems that are both running in parallel and competing for answers. You can imagine the politics. Anyway, they dealt with it very well. Um, also in Cambridge was the text speech team, a couple of faces from the people were there. So all that stuff going on. One of the things that so we worked with those people, we didn't tend to, to ship much, but one thing we did ship was this, which is um, we worked with David Morrow, who's now another, um, uh, David's at a different um, drone company. So this was the, I don't know what the state of this is, and none of these people are at Amazon anymore. Um, so you can see that what, I don't know, who knows what that means, but this is a, a drone which virtually took off and has transited to horizontal flight because, the interest here and the task that we were working on with David Morrow 
on the right, who's now at another drone company and using the same techniques we use, which is multi-fidelity emulation, was what we deployed, um, was, is that the transit from vertical to horizontal flight requires going through some turbulent states that are very difficult to predict and simulate. And what we built was, uh, well, actually what David built. So what we did is we trained David and his team up on Gaussian process emulation and him and his team built in collaboration with Mark Pullen, who worked for us as an ex F1 engineer, uh, built the controller that enables this to do what it's about to do again, which is transit from a uh, horizontal to vertical flight. What's so funny about that is Gur, who's on the left there, is now like a major advisor to the drone company that David works for. And at the time, they were very excited by the specification of this drone, which is the specification that Jeff Wilkie talks about in a, one of the videos. And that was the specification that we felt was necessary in order to deploy these zones. So that was the target that what you would have to do to deploy drones and make them useful for delivery. But the, um, the, uh, the, the targets that David and Gur have hit with their new startup company are much better with a totally different drone design. But they are still using Gaussian process emulation under the hood. Um, so, so although I think that that is one of the coolest looking things I've ever seen, that sort of TIE fighter shape for the drone, apparently David and Gur have moved on from that design. Uh, so it just shows how interesting and difficult these things are. But um, so there's, there's, there's Jeff Wilkie again talking about that at a big Amazon event and then showing the drone on stage and that drone isn't deployed. And in this talk, he sort of says, we're gonna be deploying this within six months. Why isn't it deployed? I mean, also you can imagine politics within the company, regulatory challenges, all those sort of things. But we hit the tech specs, uh, which um, was a really exciting project to be involved with. And, I tell you, the first time I saw that thing fly, I was I was actually slightly emotional. Um, we did move into the supply chain uh, team though, and um, Devesh, who's, these were the, my bosses at the time, the, who would sit in those meetings and say, "Why haven't we got enough of this? Why haven't we got enough of that?" Devesh is now CTO at Deliveroo, so he's moved to London. Lose like somewhere else in Amazon at a senior level. Um, but this little video here tells you about it's the, it's the advertising video to come and join the supply chain team at Amazon. But basically what's going on that's hidden in that video is what you're trying to do is combine a demand forecast with a supply forecast along with your cost basis. And your cost basis includes all sorts of numbers around how much it costs to store an item but, and what the value is for a customer if you have that item in stock, that's called the consumer in stock value. So like how good does it feel for the customer? So it's like, it's a weird value because it's like they try and measure it there's certain items that are items that bring customers back. So there's a value associated with that. And that's how you include long-term thinking now, isn't it? But there's other values that are more standard values. And then these things are combined together to make purchase orders automatically. So I used to argue that Amazon's supply chain was the world's largest AI in terms of the amount of money it's spending every week, which somehow we weren't allowed to say the amount of money. But if you think of Amazon's revenue at the time was about a hundred billion. And if you think large amounts of that revenue are going on buying stock for the website, you can work out, roughly speaking, how much money our automated buying systems are spending every week. So fully automated, right? Um, and, and you can imagine how shocking it is when you find that one of these services has been providing the wrong numbers for a couple of months and what that might mean for how much revenue you've lost. Um, so the forecasting team were a real key part of that. And so this, uh, you can see Jennifer Freshwater talking about some of those, um, some of the challenges in, in, in doing that in, in another one. And it says Jeff Wilkie, but it's, all, but it's linked to the point where Jennifer talks. And Ping, who worked for Jennifer, she was running a great team. Dean Foster was an academic originally, but was in that team. I worked a lot with Dean around issues around how you make uh, predictions for what the forecast demand should be. So that's sort of all feeding in to this sort of wider ecosystem. So one of the fun, you know, and then this is the team I actually worked in, Narayan, particularly on the right, supply tech, but this is the buying team. Um, so these are all OR buying experts. They're not AI people. I was the machine learning person in amongst them. But all of these people are coming from more like um, a sort of a manufacturing background or a supply chain background. They're expert in operations research. There's a lot of econometricians in there and they use a bunch of different models that you wouldn't necessarily think of machine learning models. Salal was, uh, I mean, he was brilliant. Um, he, he was, Salal and, and Narayan were the two people in this picture 
who I learned so much from, from learning, listening to genuine deep experts in other domains and realizing how limited and shallow AI thinking is relative to trying to solve problems in the real world. Um, and Stalal is now, I think he's a distinguished engineer, vice president. Um, uh, I found out about the supply chain work because I did one of Salal's promotion reviews and I thought, wow, this is like the coolest thing in the company. And that's why we ended up moving to that team. Um, but when you're trying to do that, you're trying to do all the things I said, you're trying to explain to Devesh, you know, uh, using all these experts and, and all the simulations, what, why things are going wrong. But as I sort of say, this historic thing, the, the way that these systems used to be built was as a monolithic system. And this is Charlie Bell, who's, who's now moved to Microsoft this year, but he used to be the technical lead of the whole of AWS. And this is a guy called Peter Voschel. Peter Voschel led the creation of AWS in terms of architecture things. And he was, I was so lucky because he was on my interview panel before I joined Amazon. I spent more time asking him questions than he got to ask me, I think. Um, and Charlie, I also asked Charlie a lot about this because I, I got to know Charlie well enough to be able to ask him about the world that they used to live in. So they actually changed the web service from a monolithic web service where all the code is in one place, one big body of code into a service where this is decomposed into separate parts. So the, that's what they did for the main web service. But what I'm showing you here is how that looks for the sort of supply chain. So you could imagine that you want to combine all these things together. So in classical software engineering, you write some large amount of code, it's all stuck together. There's some big executable that does all those things. What Peter was tasked with doing was looking at the website that at the time Charlie was running and was basically collapsing under the strain of worldwide access. You know, they were just trying to, was, the thing was called Obidos. And I asked Charlie about it. He said, I was just trying to keep the lights on. Peter was up the hill doing whatever he was doing. I didn't even know or care. I had no time to think about it. Um, but what Peter was doing was changing from this type of monolithic system to this. And this, I've, I've drawn it in a certain way. You could draw multiple paths through it. Because what I'm trying to show is some notion of a streaming architecture where a demand forecast is made by one service. That service is owned by a small team. That's Ping and Jenny Freshwater and Dean. The supply forecast is being made by another team. That's Salal and Narayan in the other picture that are making that. Um, then the cost predictions are coming from other services, econometricians. They're all owned and operated separately by different teams. They all conform to certain standards in terms of their being asked to share their data in certain ways. And then the result is it goes through a purchase ordering service, which, which sends out to customers the request for the purchase. The way that these things all link is with REST APIs, right? And that's the thing. That, so Bezos defined this in 2006, and that was the architecture that Peter Voschel came up with. The challenge we face, why this isn't a data, this is called a service-oriented architecture, and why it isn't a data-oriented architecture is the, the real problem we face from an emulation perspective is these links are not surface programmatically. So if you're trying to understand what the map of data flow through the system is, they're not surfaced as standard in systems with REST APIs, because the REST API can be buried. What it's calling, you can't necessarily see. If you use streaming architectures like Kafka, it turns out that the whole architecture is set up to have that for you. But as standard, that's not surfaced. So finding these flows through these systems is quite difficult programmatically. And that's the sort of thing you would need to do um, the, the project that we're interested in, which is like being able to emulate in the system. For your projects, there's many more things you could look at in terms of um, uh, simulations. And I've just tried to give you a, a set of examples here. You'll see they're more detailed in the notes. One of the things I'm very excited about that I've already mentioned is um, Jordan Bell Masterson. And we, we can show you that video, but it's not public video. And, and colleagues built this cartoon version of the Amazon supply chain um, that is available and linked there called uh, Mini Scott, which is exactly the system all those people worked on, but in a cartoon version coded in Python. So if you want to sort of play with, with that as part of your project, that's an option. But I've listed a number of other. The news vendor problem is the, is the OR problem at the core of the Amazon supply chain problem. That's how they work out the stock. So I've, I've listed a link to that in this case for ordering NFL replica jerseys. Someone's played with the news vendor problem. It's an OR system. And then a bunch of other stuff here, different simulations, the mountain car model in the OpenAI gym, Hodgkin-Huxley model, which is a model of neural firings. 
I've dug out, so we actually do have projects where we work with an F1 team um, uh, on their actual race simulation, but that takes a lot of writing of contracts and rubbish like that. But so we're doing that with a couple of part two projects at the moment. But if you were interested in doing something in this space, I, could, I found this, someone's written a race simulation Python for Formula One. It's available there. Fluid dynamics is the sort of thing. So there's, you can find stuff in that Python. Uh, finite element analysis for, for looking at stresses in subsystems would be another example of the type of simulation you might be interested in. Network simulation, a discrete event simulation. So if we're interested in like the Amazon uh, AWS network or something like that, and how how much um, capability they have to provide in Prime Video to deal with the launch of the World Cup or something on that, you know, then you do network simulation. So that's another form of simulation. And the Gillespie algorithm, which is the chemical one. The one I found is in Python 2.7, so be a bit aware of that. Um, and by the way, I'm not claiming any of these are particularly nicely coded. I'm just saying that they exist, right? Often they're badly coded because they're written by domain experts who want to, you know, are interested more in creating something that they're interested in, not written by computer scientists. Um, that's just the way of it, and, and that should be okay. Of course, in the big one that you're going to hear from uh, British Antarctic Survey about would be like the climate simulation, right? So if you think about the climate simulation, and I sort of tried to map it a little bit onto what I said about the supply chain earlier, you've got the same sort of things going on. You actually, in a climate simulation like this, it's not one piece of monolithic code, although it could be. It, they haven't done service-oriented architectures. They haven't done that type of thinking, uh, which is a further problem for if we're doing emulation in those spaces. So it's sort of, but it's still decomposed to some extent. You've got atmospheric models, you've got sea models, you've got land models, um, and you've got models of anthropomorphic activity, human activity. One of the things we're working on with British Antarctic Survey is their ice sheet model. They've got an ice sheet model that interacts with the ocean model. So you could think of that as monolithic, or you could think of that as a little bit like the supply chain system. The reason they're separating these models into different parts is because, of course, they're interacting, but they're interacting in defined ways, passing amounts of water up or down or passing amounts of energy in, in those sorts of ways. So that means that one team can work on the atmospheric model. There's a lot of work in um, applied mass and theoretical physics around atmospheric models and in chemistry here. Another team can work on the ocean model. And then they do this thing where they try and bring all these things together. And that's called calibration. And it sounds like it's filled with heuristics and hacks, as you might expect, to try and get the thing to operate as the Earth does. So you've got the same sort of challenge that we have. We saw sort of that Peter Voschel and Charlie Bell ended up solving. And actually what's happened is most of these code bases are written in a time when we did monolithic code. So you tend to find that it's actually quite hard to break the thing down in the same way it was hard to break down Amazon's um, web services into different services and, and model them separately. So we get the same sort of problem there. But the reason we're sort of trying to do all this is this to run this cycle we call experiment analyzed design. Because what we're trying to do, if we want to answer questions about the system we're interested in, if we want to give the information to the vice president or to governments or whoever else we care about, we need to be able to run a cycle quickly of being able to do experiments faster, right? So the main bottleneck in many of these systems, certainly in the supply chain, is the speed at which we can run an experiment and the cost of running an experiment. So the final, by the way, the final experiment you would run before you shipped new code in the Amazon supply chain was an A-B test, right? An A-B test, you would randomize, you would, you would say your new business logic that's going to improve the quality of your supply chain, you would randomize across items in the supply chain, apply the business logic to some random subset and apply the sort of treatment. And then you would have your sort of standard business logic. And then you would look at how much money you're making across these two different categories and see if this is improving. Not, and it's, by the way, it's not money in terms of profit. In Amazon's case, it's something called long-term free cash flow, which is a different thing. They never optimize for profit. They optimize for future growth and customer stuff. So that cycle is always what you're trying to run. And emulation surrogate modeling is about speeding that bit up and making these two bits easier. Because some of the explanations you can get out of a surrogate model, because the, the surrogate model is a function, are easier to understand than the explanations you can get out of trying to look, unpick the code. Um, so I'll skip that vision there. And just sort of show you this example in the packing problem, which is new for this year. Um, 
So the packing problem thing I liked because it's this, this very mathematical thing and this guy's done this whole sort of website on it and I just think that is so cool. Um, but one of the things I, I, I've done for you is extract the data for this packing problem. So remember the packing problem. So what we're interested in here is we've got a number of unit squares and we want to know if we're packing them into another square, um, what is the minimum size of square we need to fit N boxes? So, so the answer is the size of the square S, which is the side of one side, and the input is the number of boxes we care about. And this is not an easy problem to solve, right? And we can't even prove some of the answers. So we had some examples of like the, the funky answers that come out that is sometimes the best known example. So I think this was the best known example for some number. And this one here, I think was proven to be, obviously it's not unique. You could slide one of those boxes up, but this is proven to be um, the best, the smallest S for this number. So what I did is I went through, um, I went through all of Eric Friedman's data and I plotted this, yeah? So, so uh, he, he doesn't write everything to full significant figures. Uh, so the significant figures are a little bit off, but I plotted the answer here. And I think even the plot itself is informative, isn't it? You can see that there's something going on. What do you think is going on where there's this weird flattening behavior? I think I know, but I haven't proved it, but I think I know why there's this weird flattening behavior, but I didn't think about it until I plotted this. Put up the new one, but then the new kind of integer size, then you know, kind of just you've got space plus and then like, is that it? Yeah, well, you've got, yeah, you, what you have, you've you saturated. I think what happens is as soon as I feel so that there's one row left at the top, maximum, like in the square, so I'm going like six cross and five up. I have no possible way of orienting more new boxes in any other way than just slotting them in. So there's this sort of interesting effect that as I go from, um, so let's see, it would be like going after six boxes, I think, I can only, and I'm not even sure this is true, I'm only guessing yeah. So I, yeah, it's similar intuition to yours. And so what you start seeing is that these, because those rows get longer, these, these, these flat bits get longer. So this is until, and then you get these jumps, but I just plotted it, right? And I don't really know. And the point is the plot is interesting and the math doesn't even really need to know for it to actually be able to pick out a function. Now I did fit a Gaussian process and we can see a number of reasons why Gaussian process isn't a good fit here, right? And the reason why the Gaussian process is not a great model here is because there's this continuity at that point where it suddenly jumps up um, and it, the Gaussian process doesn't handle that well. Right, um, so it's not actually not a great surrogate model in this case, even though it's non-linear. It doesn't like dealing with these discontinuities, and there's basically these discontinuities are appearing every time we get to this situation where there's an empty row. You can look at Eric's site to sort of see the sort of pattern of this, and um, but but there's still something interesting in just the plotting of it that is like you don't actually have to know the maths or anything just to sort of get the answer you want and start getting some information. You might even just by eyeing this stuff wonder. If the fact that these two are lower means that there's, there's, there's effort, worthwhile effort to push them up. Maybe there isn't, maybe there's another pattern there. But it's sort of interesting, isn't it? Just by the plotting of it, we're seeing something that isn't obvious when we just describe the problem. Or perhaps it's, it's obvious to cleverer people than me. But, um... So it, this is the thing I wanted to leave you with for the, the two minutes and then we'll do the thing where we pop outside is, um, what this picture looks like, say, for the UK Met Office, which is tr which are trying to um, model not just the, um, on the one side, we've got forecast lead time going to greater than 100 years. So to the, the right, your right, yeah, uh, we've got climate models. And towards the left, we've got forecast times going from 48 hours to seven days. So these are weather models. And then what you're also seeing as we go up is the spatial scales changing. So what you start seeing is that the, the grayed out models are ones that are no longer used, retired models. So you're seeing that, the, that we're interested, we're, we're tending to push down as we get more compute into more fine grained grids for both the weather and also the climate. You see the same things sort of happening. The models at the top that have been retired are the coarser grain grids because we're getting computational capability to compute out to hundreds of years ahead um, with uh, 
course, the grain grids. But notice that the, 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 still that we are talking about 80 kilometers square grids in order to be able to compute that far in advance. So that's the sort of challenge we're facing. And the thing that, that is very interesting, I think and we used a lot in the supply chain is this notion that we've sort of that I hinted at before, but I've sort of got it up diagrammatically now, is that what you have is you have the real world on one side and you have simulators of different fidelities. So whether they're more coarse grains or more fine grains, and you can ask these things. So here I assume this, the size of the box is like the cost, you know, it's a slow simulator. So presumably finer grain. And then we've got a couple of coarser grain simulators that are perhaps doing different ways of abstracting the solution. So what we're trying to do in multi-fidelity emulation is go beyond that first emulation. So that would be like emulating one simulator, the packing problem and make that prediction like I tried with the Gaussian process. And we're trying to do, oh, well, let's see if we can start linking how that simulator is calibrated to what we see in the real world. That's definitely something we were doing in the F1 examples. You do all this simulation work, but then you know the proof of the pudding is in how fast the car goes around the track. So you do get real world data, it's just expensive. With climate, by the time we get the real world data, it's kind of a bit too late, isn't it? Um, but multi-fidelity says, well, we can also combine our understanding about how a fine grain simulator and a coarse grain simulator vary and that's the sort of thing that you know would be really nice to see in projects is you just sort of look at a simulator where you can vary how coarse grained and fine grained it is do some multi-fidelity emulation and perhaps some sensitivity analysis these are things you know we'll lecture about in in the coming times to sort of show well it seems that this this system is more sensitive to this parameter than that parameter and here's the analysis we've done and the hope is that for many of you in your research that that would be actually a useful process my my, my favorite most exciting thing about this course is i had a part three student called daniel once who was working on us working with us on something else and at the end of his thing he told me he said oh yeah i had a mate in engineering who was doing a project and uh I pointed him at the uh, ML for the Physical World course, and he basically used that to deliver his entire master's project. So he just took the techniques we're doing here, but applied them to the system he was interested in. That's entirely and exactly what we're trying to make this course do. Of course, many of you won't have domains of interest yet. So one of the tasks you have to do is which of these things interested you and work out in a group what thing you'd like to play with and work on with these techniques. Okay, so I've overrun by two minutes, so I'm gonna stop there. But the rest of the notes is just introducing you to Gaussian processes in Python and the GPI framework, which is an easy way and showing you examples of doing this in practice that you can play with in your own time in order to um, get a sense of, of, of how easy or hard